do? You're there. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you and welcome to Global Resources for Men here live on Facebook. Today we have John Wolfstone and my dear friend Jake LaRue. John Wolfstone is new to our platform, but I am super excited to hang out with him and my friend Jake today. John is originally from Fort Collins, Colorado, a place that is also near and dear to my heart, beautifully set in the mountains in the United States. But now, he went from the mountains to the sea, the Salish Sea, to be precise, up in British Columbia, Canada, and <laughs> he's on Salt Spring Island along the 49th parallel right through the middle. And if you, any of you are familiar with the landscape of that particular area, John is here to talk to us about the masculine archetypes and the really deep dives that we can take in regards to death and all the different things that are combined and surrounding it. Our dear friend Jake will jump into that conversation a little bit later after John shares more about what he's doing for business and what took him on this journey in the work. So John, thank you so much for being here with us today. And Jake, of course, you too. John, tell yeah, us. Thank <laughs> yeah, I just want to say thank you and just um, honor your gift. I feel like as you started this conversation, this like radio talk show host, <laughs> came out um and i'm <laughs> lord I, I like feel like you have years of um experience and it's just beautiful to be on the um receiving end of that gift of yours so thank you for uh, inviting me here and i'm yeah really um excited you know i feel like to start off i want to say that my business and it's taken me a long time this really links deeply to what it is my business is, um, is directly linked with my understanding of like my purpose, my reason for being here on planet earth. Um, you know, in business, it took me a long time to actually come back around, like having to go pretty alternative in many ways and question so much about the dominant system that we are raised in, which at its simplest form is uh, destroying the planet that we are and a part of and which obviously makes no sense um <laughs> there's like deep questioning that i had to go through um and it took a long time for me to come around and recognize oh business isn't evil money isn't evil um they're actually incredible tools um and containers to be giving like the gifts that i was meant to bring here to this planet so i just want to say for me it's been this very wide berth and full turn and i'm just in the early days of having gone on a big journey now stepping out professionally back into the world to really share and create impact. Um, so with that, maybe I'll share a bit of my um, story that can kind yeah, of paint please. the picture. Please do, please do. Hey, yeah. Take the picture, tell us some of the things that you had to face, the obstacles that you overcame to be able to step into where you are. Yeah. You know, I can say that this story begins most easily. Um, I was in my mid-20s and I was living in San Francisco, California, um, which is, you know, a pretty alternative, uh, like, postmodern big city. Um, and I'd worked my ass off, um, arriving there around, I was really broke and brokenhearted when I was 23, to really building up a uh, professional life. I was working in digital media, I had um, like a side business doing film. Um, I was teaching at-risk youth filmmaking, so I had really meaningful work. I had a salary job. I also had a business leading people backpacking, combining it with like yoga. And I lived in a art collective. So I had this wild life. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I had made it. Like I was 26 and I feel like I had made it. Um, Except that having finally arrived to like having money, having a career, having side projects, having tons of girlfriends, like really having the world at my fingertips in this incredibly beautiful big city. Um, what came around once I finally made it was this like deep angst that had kind of been with me my whole life, but this like gnawing anxiety that like 
something's not right. There's just something about this whole enterprise of the way I'm living my like life, having now quote made it, that isn't right. And I started looking at guys in my office, you know, that were 35, 40 guys I lived with in my art um, collective. And I was just really turned off. I was like, is, you know, people partying well into their fifties, like people just working in this office, this like maybe meaningful, but also kind of dead end job. And I was like, is this, is this all there is? Um, and at the same time, I was growing increasingly um, aware that things were really off with our planet and the way humans were interacting with it. And it started to just come to me. It's like, whoa, there's, we're not, things aren't getting better. <laughs> and that there, it's not just like some abstract, like we actually live on this planet and there's consequences and they're starting to really show themselves. Um, and thank God at this time through however these things work, I was connected to a group of people and really a culture that understood something that I now know is rites of passage, which is a big part of the work that I do, which you could say at like a basic level are the way that human beings move through different life stages. And that actually there are different life stages to move through and you, it doesn't just happen necessarily by itself, That actually culture, every healthy human culture on planet earth would help people often through challenges that would kind of peel back the like layers and in some ways like let the old life stage, you could say like die or um, expire and help you kind of birth and step into the um, new one. So yeah. I, I love how you talk about the different stages, just like real a quick aside, because I yeah. feel like so often in life, people think of rites of passage as a singular moment, typically transitioning right. from youth to adulthood versus the rites of passage of say becoming a parent a rites of passage right. become being like an adult and then becoming an elder. Like these are different right. rites of passage and stages and evolutions, um, rites of passage in the military, rites of passage, even in like, totally. more like traditional business, um, states, you know, when you're going and you're interning somewhere and you get to go through a rite of passage that you've done enough time, you come to a certain skill set that now you can elevate into the next level. Um, and that it doesn't have to be a rite of passage necessarily with violence, right? Um, how some people would traditionally think of a rite of passage. Right. <laughs> so, much so, so much so. This is, I'm so glad you brought this up too, because I think when I think of terms of rite of passage and how there are stages of it that our culture supports, our culture doesn't support it. And that's something that we've completely missed out on. And that's such a huge issue that we're dealing with, with, the, you know, some call it toxic masculinity. I hate that term. I exactly. say undeveloped and immature masculinity. Yeah. Bingo. Exactly. And that, for like me, living in, quote, a toxic masculine or undeveloped, immature masculine culture, you know, all these rites of passage, which are many, for me, really boiled down at that time to this all important one of adulthood initiation. Right. Which is essentially yeah. the rite of passage when you move from an adolescent and an adolescent psychology to a adult and a adult um, psychology. And what our culture really fails to see is that just because you turn 18 can maybe, you know, vote, like drive, maybe drink alcohol, maybe join the military, that this does not mean that your psyche isn't is necessarily any different or more um, mature, that you are not actually a more mature being just because society confers you the status. And every healthy culture ever understood this deeply and would of all the rites of passage this is probably the most of a ordeal you could say it might have been in some ways the, the the hardest one because it was essentially where through the help of culture and containership and like mentorship and really carefully crafted ordeals like encounters that put pressure on one to challenge one and grow um essentially there'd be a shift from like ego-centered consciousness where it's like solely about the self which again makes sense from the point of view of a um, adolescent and isn't wrong it's just part of the a developmental path but there comes a time when that center of consciousness needs to shift um into a more like you could say like soul or eco like uh, ecological centered consciousness where one starts 
I guess, centering one's service to the world or the tribe or, you know, whatever, whatever frame one is in and that this shift uh, doesn't happen by itself and often comes through a very, very well-crafted encounter with death, mm-hmm. you know, amongst other like things, because death is essentially the thing the ego is most um, afraid of. And once the self has a very deep encounter and therefore starts to build a relationship with death, one can essentially like partner with the um, ego. It's not about killing the ego. That doesn't really, as far as I know, not quite how it works, but through facing deep experience of death and coming to terms with that and coming to terms with that, my ego, myself, my sense of self will die. Everything I love will die. Everything is in a process of death and decay and rebirth always that this like uh, stranglehold on this like egoic need to survive which comes with it like the need to have fame and status and like immature power all these things can fall away so one can really humbly be of service to the world and as we look at the current world that we have and the current culture of toxic immature masculinity which is kind of a baseline for the wider mass culture it's really just uh, like adolescently stuck uh, masculine and now kind of global mainstream culture that is addicted to ego to like egotistical levels of power and status and really seeking of like different levels of fame which really root in a fear of death because if you are afraid of dying or if ego is afraid of dying you're going to do anything to quote like get fame or get power or make to essentially buffer yourself from that reality of death that really nothing you can do is gonna make you live on forever, quote unquote. Um, And the absence of that deep relationship, what we have is that pursuit of persisting on um, and in a way that actually the deepest level creates a like pathology of infinite growth, which is the like basic economic and therefore like ecological situation that we are now in because what death I know it's probably a lot of content, so I'll wrap it up here. A relationship with death at a cultural level and also a personal one fundamentally gives one a relationship with limits. You know, death's kind of the ultimate limit and healthy cultures that were more regenerative or um, sustainable were so because they understood limits. They could have expanded. They could have killed more animals. They could have like burned more landscape. They could have evolved more technology and they didn't because they understood balance is, is essentially about limits and the ultimate limit that helps bore that relationship to the, all the rest is coming deeply in contact with death, which is completely not happening in this infinite growth, death denial culture that we have. This guy, that was oh a lot gosh. maybe. Yeah, I'm wondering if that lands or <laughs> no. That was that was fantastic. There's so many so many things that I'm thinking about, and um, with the aspect of limits, and it makes me think of um, think of expectations and boundaries, and how so often mm. we put expectations mm-hmm. on ourselves and on relationships, and how if we stay stuck in a certain concept, that is our limit because we're not able to go beyond that and be a greater aspect to have a healthier relationship with ourselves or other people if you're not willing to recognize what the limits of that concept that thought construct are and so if you place Mm -hmm. those on somebody else then you're not able to be the healthiest aspect of yourself to evolve to go through that next stage Um, And a lot of pain occurs within people because they put expectations on the relationships they want to have with other people that will not necessarily be reciprocated. And some people don't evolve. And sometimes you have to allow the metaphoric death of a relationship, be it with a family member, a friend, a colleague, because that you've hit the limit of what that relationship can be because you're in a certain place and the person, the other person, whoever that might be, has expanded themselves. And as you expand and change, your value system can change. It doesn't mean that you were inauthentic earlier, 
it means that you discovered more within yourself, within your community, within your spiritual experience, if that's what you align yourself with. And now you're trying to go on and you can say that other person, they're not a bad person. It's not that I don't care about that person, but within this scope to have the healthiest environment for myself and for that other person, I need to have a depth of that relationship and move forward in integrity and authenticity to stay in alignment with my values, which in that is the love you have may have for another person to about allow them to stay in the alignment of their values, which may no longer match your own. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, what I really hear in some ways underneath is the willingness to let grief be part of life and a part of the a relational path. And it's in some ways the like fear of death, or the denial of death in our culture, which manifests in all of these levels of us clinging to like static forms of things and often dependent and maybe abusive um, relational patterns or just like relationships that kind of become dead and they become dead because we're not embracing the death, which really means to embrace the feeling and the pain of that, which you could say is what grief is, but the kind of secret of grief, although it is, it is difficult. It's not easy. But the thing is grief is what allows death to feed life because on the other side of grief is deep, deep love and kind of a trust that sure, this part, this function, this moment dies, this relationship changes as all do all this change, but like life itself goes on and there's a trust that something even more beautiful can come from that letting go again. And that's in some ways, like it's really about developing this trust but you can't do that without grieving and really right. feeling the, the pain. It's not, it's not at all about like buffering oneself from the pain. It's about really embracing it. And that integrity comes from embracing it and feeling it. Right. And that, that ego that we put forward, uh, sometimes I wasn't able to make it work because our ego is like, we should be able to win. We should be able to succeed. And so when we come to a place um, where a relationship um, can no longer grow as friends or otherwise, there's this dead, this death to it, right? And so the ego can get a little bit talkative about that experience. And why couldn't you make it work? Why couldn't you communicate to them? Why couldn't you reach them in a way that it would allow you to heal something if it needed to be healed? to evolve past a conflict, what happened there, right? And to be able to step away from that ego, a step away from that expectation and just be fully present in the moment and allow whatever it is to simply be and have grace with that, that is, that can be right. really difficult. Right. And I, and I think at like a baser level, like for me, it's really coming back continually to certain foundations. And I think foundationally, uninitiated people are going to try to fill themselves with relationships of many kinds. Because the basic like understanding of an uninitiated adolescent human is that you connect to source through outside. Right. So relationships of various kinds feed you and fill you, but in a way of like not integration. And it's really, it becomes like addictive in the way that addiction is of trying to fill oneself what you can't fill. Right. And for, for, for like me, the crux is, especially for a man that to go through this like encounter with death, which you could say like mythologically is an encounter with the goddess, which always was this principle of death in rebirth, which women more inherently have a um, connection to because of childbirth and menstruation, this like natural cyclical process of death and rebirth that happens that men don't have as naturally in our um, bodies, that by going through that process, men, what I've seen and learned is that there's a basic primary relationship with the earth. Like in one language, you could say that before a man can be um, relational, especially with say like a partner outside of oneself, a man's first marriage must be to the earth. And most indigenous cultures knew this. And from that deep place of integrity to 
the earth itself or herself, however you want to um, conceive of that, relationships outwardly no longer become dependent, where I think that's a lot of where this like stranglehold of not allowing them to change or die and evolve comes from because we're so dependent on them. So of course, we're not going to let it die or change or grow. So for me, it's like, for sure, there's things to do to work on the um, relational level, but in, unless, unless one is really evolving out of this adolescent state, which just happens um, alongside um, each other, it's really difficult to have a healthy relationship that's actually going to go deep. And what many men also do, they just don't have deep, intimate relationships because it would force them to bring up the undigested pain that's just accumulated in their like life that they continually pushed off from like feeling that they don't have the resource to even feel um, anyways. And the other part about that deep relationship with the earth is that it gives you resource to feel the deeper threads of pain that actually lead to deeper intimacy with other human beings and really with all of um, life. Tell us more about what you mean by resource. Yeah. So in some ways, I think I can um, explain this in a simple kind of almost a pictorial way. Um, the journey of adulthood initiation, which I could say is very personal, but I could say collectively, we're at a cultural moment where the collective needs to go on a very much adulthood initiation journey. And that journey into death is a journey into the, into the like underworld, which is a journey into the shadow, which is literally means like, say we all grew up in imperfect families, which is pretty much everybody. And that's carrying some probably layers of trauma passed down from ancestors, you know, from like parents or grandparents to parents, so on. The journey oh, yes. into Genetic the underworld. Trauma. Yeah, there's, there's like, yeah, there's like epigenetic proof of how trauma passes on. Um, and so the journey into the underworld towards death is the journey into all the shadowed pain and the like key to actually having the capacity to meet that and not continually just deny it because it's too much is to gain more resourcing is to gain organically more like strength. And that is the opposite of being the hero, which is, which is what we're trained to believe, especially. And the thing is what I've learned and Jake, you can probably speak of more. I think in pop media, we have this image of like in the, um, in the um, military being like, a hero but actually what i've deeply learned is that's all dependent on teamwork and it's mm -hmm. like i've had some friends who are navy seals and it's like actually fundamentally their strength is about a team which is a form of like resource and for yeah. me it's like teaming with the like culture and the earth and mentors like there's so many forms of like resource but it's fundamentally learning you alone are not strong enough to face death or the like associated uh, emotional pain that um, you are going to have to face. <laughs> Let me freak out here. I got chills right at this moment. I got totally got chills at this moment. I was listening to a podcast earlier this morning, uh, Warwick Schiller with uh, Jessica Whiteplume, I believe is her name. And there was the conversation about, about that warrior intellect and coming down from, from that warrior intellect that we're all raised with and being able to find that, that, uh, that kind of vulnerability in ourselves. Um, you're, you're killing me here. I got a th uh, like so much that, <laughs> that's hitting home with me. When you're talking about rites of passage and, you know, and, and taking that responsibility and, and changing that next stage in your life, I think one of the things we lack with the, with the rite of passage is also on a societal level, because we don't have that, adolescents becoming men, moving into that transition, don't have a line of demarcation where society treats them like a man, not exactly. only in giving them respect as a man, but giving them the expectations of a man as well. So yeah. that they, they come into the, that place as a contributor to their tribe. You know, you're, we're, not, we're not really taking care of you anymore. And there's that you've shown that you have these resources. Now we're going to ask you to use them for the benefit of, of, the, you know, of, of our tribe, of our people to, to move forward. And that's where, that's where the warrior intellect starts to make that shift into an empathic or an emotional intellect when you start to connect with the whole rather than the ego you know i've yeah. uh, it, it fulfills that sense in the young man to prove himself i mean think about it we're always taking yeah. stupid unnecessary risks i mean 
jumping trash cans in the alley on the bicycle to jumping off a of shit way too high for us to be jumping off of to with the lack of a rite of passage, we're creating our own. We're joining gangs. Yeah. We're enlisting in the military. We're volunteering for stuff that is most likely to kill us. And we're trying to fulfill our, our traditional role in society on the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs as the yeah. providers, as the security, as the protectors, you know, this is our job, but attaining that peak of self-fulfillment never occurs in the mind of a man when he's thinking about what it means to be a man. So on right. that note, really quick, for those of you who do not know my friend Jake LaRue, Jake is actually the reason that we this don't have group exists and the reason oh. that oh. the global summits for men were created because of Jake's initiation and desire to um, create the space and have a conversation about masculinity and other difficult subjects for men. So Jake is a former mm. Marine and partners with horses and has his own um, podcast he's coming out with, Man with a Horse, and is writing a book, if I remember correctly. And mm. he is going to be doing another summit that I will be hosting that has to do with men working with horses. So there's a little bit yes, of a background yeah. for my dear friend, Jake, in North Carolina and the United States and um why he's here today um is to support this whole conversation and getting to give a really broad aspect of diving into the concept of death from both the military perspective non-military perspective and you know just human perspective so jake and john again thank you so much for the conversation and yeah let's keep going Yes, yes. I got one thing I wanted to circle back to about the whole rite of passage that we're missing and it ties right back into grief is we are not given the room to grieve our passage from one place in life to the next. Yeah. We're not given that space to honor what we've been and where we've come from to where we're going because the expectations in, in our modern society are constant motion forward and introspection and reflection on the past and on the journey isn't really part of what we're emphasizing anymore. Right, right, yeah. Because when you when you when you grieve something, that's really how you can both thank it and like mourn it, and then truly let it go. Whether that be accepting your first job, and it's like, yeah, my free time is not my free time in the same way. Or I think a big one for men is becoming a father, and not having the space to not just grieve, but also be like witnessed and just um, acknowledged, which is a, such, such a part of Jake you were saying, like part of a rite of passage is being acknowledged and held differently, both with different like gifts or opportunities and different expectations and um, responsibilities in a culture. And, you know, for me, as this like a really clear example of this. I ran a boys rite of passage program for 12 and 13 year old boys for many years. It was a two-year program, and the start of it um, existed with us. I mean, we, like, worked with knives a lot and carving. Mm -hmm. And the start of the program, we had this whole ceremony to give knives, to, like, give a kid, to give a boy his, like, personal knife. But the thing is, part of that ceremony was, like, acknowledging the power of that tool and what comes with it, which is, like, this freedom, these opportunities, and this great – um, responsibility and the expectations and that if like any unsafety you know we had these like um, agreements and we like mentored them to how to work with a knife safely but if they were not upholding the uh, integrity of that like code of honor we would take that knife back you know there was real consequences and that's and that's what's and like think about that now just as like a example of metaphor for men like men need this too and then they're given these huge tools of like business or success or sometimes guns, like many things, but they're not given that same ceremonial, um, yeah, government. Yeah. So many, we have so many, like, you could say like toys that were like given that were not honored or taught how to work with as like really sacred tools that need to be handled with deep, deep care. And that's like a big part of what the adulthood, um, initiation journey is. And you could say really the deepest power as a human being, as a man, is life and like death. Like I can create death and I create death every single day by like eating, you know, whether I'm eating a plant or an animal, there is death there. We do and it by breathing. We do it by breathing, right. And the thing is, it's like, 
that's why I don't believe in this whole, all humans shouldn't have any impact on the earth because we always have impact, every indigenous, but it's like, how do we tend and be conscious of that impact? And the thing is, when we fear death, when we don't acknowledge death, what we actually do is create death all around us instead of being conscious with it. And then like another way to look at the wider cultural frame is that because we're so out of tune or un, um, un um, acknowledging or phobic about death, we are unconsciously creating death everywhere. The level of like, like ecocide. So for me, actually, it's, and this is where for me, hunting, not at all in the way that I think any of us think about it in a mass cultural way, but in like the most sacred way, and this would happen in many cultures um, around the world, young men were taught to take life with the deepest care and respect and honor and years of training. So where when they, when they, when they took life, they took life with a fully open heart to fully empathetically feel, Reverend. which I'm guessing is very, very different than how, for instance, Jake, you were trained in the military to take life because you probably couldn't do it if your heart was fully open, which is like, it's, it's the like, it's uh, the like grounding rod to that power of death. I was told when, um, I was told when I, when I first uh, deployed to the Persian Gulf, I got a letter from a man who was a Vietnam veteran who was friends with my parents. And his advice to me was that, says, I know you, you're a good person, you've got a good heart, lock it away. Put everything of value to you in a box, lock it and bury it as deeply as you can. And don't even think about opening it until you come home. And it took me 20 years to crack the lid at that box and without the proper resources and support, the fallout of that opening was drastic. And it's been in the last 10 years that all the pieces have started coming back together and I'm 50. So, uh, you know, uh, um, yeah, we're, uh, I'm, I'm hearing so much from you that, that makes me thrilled to hear it from a younger man to start with, that there's this thought process going on, but just the recognition. And I think that's one of the biggest things that men are challenged with is we tend to get defensive when we're called out on anything, even within our friends within our circle we tend to get defensive when we're called out on anything and most men have lost the level of honest intimacy with other men um, as our cultures change that's gone away as well we don't spend the time interacting on or interacting on a fundamental level with other men outside of situations like the military or gangs or prisons you know or, or these institutions that that foster such a strong sense of brotherhood with the loss of the empathic and the emotional side. Um, yeah, we're, we're right. lacking that so much as a community and so much as a culture that it makes, it fills my heart to see other people thinking along the same terms. How do we provide this? How do we provide a rite of passage, a demarcation for responsibility, a level of acceptance and respect from the society, the culture, the neighborhood, the block, the people in the same house that a boy becoming a man is living in? And, and how do we foster in them the sense of reaching toward that next stage in passage and, and mm. progressing on? Because uh, it's a whole lot of grown men running, or grown uh, you know, little boys running around in man suits right now. That's what I'm looking for, yeah. And, and I was one for a long period of time. Right. You know, and I really love what you bring up. I kind of rambled there, but. No, it's perfect. I, I, yeah, you know, um, you know, we talked about the question of resource and I think that men's groups and the topic of like deep brotherhood is one of the core resources necessary for men in this time. And something for me, I feel really passionate about along this like rite of passage um, framing is that like a big part of men's group is around, I think, like emotional support and kinship and brotherhood, but it's also around um, accountability and yes. holding, each, holding each other to um, integrity. And the thing is, what I've seen in some men's groups, let's say kind of the wider cultures, it's often very um, um, horizontal in that it's like, where, what is, what's the arc of where the group is, is, is going? And one thing I realize is that one, men's groups 
to really evolve need to be intergenerational because it's a lot about those adult men helping younger men through their own rites of passage and modeling and mentoring and like men in our age range being being brought up and mentored by older men or elders and Uh, working towards supporting each other through these various rites of passage as like men and really building a culture. And that for me, the word culture, it's not just a men's group, it's a men's culture. And these groups are this little cultural unit. We're little like, for lack of better words, tribal units that are trying to re like form, but no, like no human ever in a more intact indigenous culture ran around primarily just of everybody their like own age, which is what happens in like school, happens in social settings. There's always was this like vertical axis of like intergenerational living that is fundamental and key. That alone can change everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just want to uh, place that here because that's a huge resource for like me getting out of just my peer group into a, a relationship with both younger and older men mm-hmm. has really. Uh, organically caused me to step up and step into a channel of more um, integrity and a like uh, evolving path with it. I, I've got, I've got something on that, that, that plays in when I was uh, 19 years old, I went to the Persian Gulf War and desert storm. Mm-hmm. And when I came home, I found myself welcomed with open arms by the generation before me, the men in my family and my father's friends who had been in Vietnam. And I found that I had a very limited amount of communication, open communication that I could have with the guys that I grew up with. And I felt that distinct shift. And, and it was a self-inflicted rite of passage. It's volunteer military. Um, right. And I have mixed feelings on whether or not that's a good thing. Um, I feel it's a bit of a, I feel that that need for a rite of passage is something that our government and our military capitalizes on for, right. but I'm not going to get political. So I'm going to drop that line of thought right now. Uh, regardless, I felt more attached to the next generation and felt capable of communicating mm. with them on a level that I couldn't before I'd gone past that point. And I've watched some of the people that I, I grew up with that haven't had either a strong positive male influence in them li- in their lives, either through an absentee father or, you know, however, right. and didn't cross one of those lines that found ways of creating their own. And a lot of them went to jail for a good long time. Some of them, that is where they found that they feel they belong within that kind of a hierarchy, within right. that sort of warrior intelligence that and they've never learned anything else. Um, and I found a, uh, I found some of them had families and and did fantastic. I'm not going to judge all of them by the standard at all, but some of them just felt displaced and and were adrift and were the same people that I knew in high school that were just doing something different to bring in an income and repeated the same patterns of behavior and had no more or less expectations from them than they ever had before in their life and never would. Uh, And and I, I find that's just me. That's how I am to be one of the saddest statements a human being can make. Um, yeah. Thank you, Jake, for bringing that in. Um, you know, actually just to say, like, I think it's totally accurate and important to name, you know, for one way, whether it's super conscious or, or like not the military and the government do capitalize on this like innate desire for a rite of passage. And like another way to say that is that death, itself is an archetypical energy which finds all humans and the question is whether or not there's a cultural context to like meet that and maybe in the world that we have the military or gangs etc are sometimes the closest way that that cultural context is um what we have so in 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 some ways things like the military even like traditional hunting culture is like kind of a step towards something really healthy but it's lacking the right cultural holding and also the, la- the right um, integration. Because I find in many friends coming out of the military is such a big um, experience. It's like the moment they come out, it's PBD, how that's going to translate into their life. If it's integrated well, if they're caught well, if there's like support, if they're honored, that could be, even if it was really hard, which it guaranteed was at some level, 
that could become really like integrated and beneficial and life-giving. But when it's not, when there's not um, acknowledgement, when there's not support for maybe the layers of trauma that got, for, for, for like me, like one other way to say it, initiation was just really carefully crafted trauma. Yes. But because it was carefully crafted, it wasn't trauma. It didn't create psychic fragmentation, which is what trauma is and what most like toxic masculine men are like dealing with. It was really well integrated, but you actually need that um, infliction of experience and pain. And it's just, is there the like integration right now in the world? There's so many, what a teacher of mine says, rough, um, rough um, initiations happening. And it's like, what are we doing to help integrate and catch people from those more rough initiatory um, experiences, which they're like still happening. There's just no container um, around them. And that for me is a big passion of like, how can we catch and integrate through men's groups and other places really hold these people as they come back from whatever kind of like journey to really integrate and turn that experience into something positive and useful and life giving. Yes. Yes. It's, um, I'm, we're, this quote went through my mind and it's from the strangest damn place from uh, Dee Snyder, the singer of Twisted Sister from a movie Strange mm. Man. Um, we must all go through a rite of passage and it must be physical and it must be painful and it must leave a mark. And the only mm -hmm. part I disagree with is that it must be physical because sometimes mm -hmm. that rite of passage can be psychological or emotional or spiritual, but we all go through them. We go through them in stages of our life. They are painful. They are, a, any passage is a loss of something previous to it. You know, the butterfly loses its comfort in its cocoon. Right. <laughs> no, it's really good. Oh, so many good things. To oh, this is, yeah, I could, I could do this for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting. I was talking to a police officer yesterday. Um, he's former, he's a former Marine. And um, he talked about the five for five. If you, are you familiar with this? Yeah. I'm not familiar. So for those of you, like Jake, do you want to? Um, no, you, you go ahead. You go ahead. I'm going to have to shut off my screen. I'm still here, but I have to move something. So. Okay. Probably. Still listening. <laughs> Jake has chickens. We love that Jake has chickens. Um, they're like his, his small children that run around his flock. Um, so the five for five is this concept that the majority of any group of people is good, but you have the 5% at the top that are exceptional human beings who actively change a system, be it an educational system, the military, they profoundly affect the world. And then you have the 5% of people in any group that have no business doing, like being there. They went into it for the wrong reasons. They're trying to like, not, they're not holding themselves personally accountable for something. They think that they're better than everybody else and they're destroying a system. And those are the people that we typically hear about in the news um, that it's just that 5% that makes things look worse than they actually are in regards to the human beings that go into a group. Um, so it's one of the reason Jake knew about it is I guess it's something that's just known in the military. So you have your five for fives. Um, and they see that in the police force um, as well, I guess, from what I hear um, from the person that I talked to. Um, and it just makes it difficult for everybody because I was talking to him about how I found that most professions, the people I engage with, you have a lot of people in a profession that are great, but because we're human, there's always going to be a small percentage of people, no matter what profession you discuss, that are unethical, that are creating problems, um, that are dangerous. Right. And I think the question is, how do we integrate that? Right. Exactly. That, that, how do we integrate? How do we um, create a safe space where we can allow people to be held accountable without getting shamed and, and validated and shut down because you can name a problem without shaming a person for it. Because right. as soon as you start to shame and invalidate a human being, they typically shut down or they get it reactive. Neither one is going to get you closer to your goal. 
or theirs that's functional, I should say. A functional goal to help a person evolve from a space. Right? Well, I gotta be honest, I'm probably gonna jump before I listen um, and then have to take a deep breath and step back and hear what's been told me. <laughs> Wait, Jake, right. you need to give me more of a frame of reference on that one. <laughs> um, what you were just talking about, it, talking to, you know, it, telling to people, telling people, you know, where you're at, what you're, what you're seeing, what you're perceiving from them. If it's something that I don't feel or see or agree with, or in a lot of contests, especially if I'm passionate about it, yeah. it's something that I might, I might jump first. I might be like, wait a minute, before I sit back and I hear what's being told me. It's and, hard. Right. It's yeah, really I mean, hard to take a deep breath. And my five, another five, my five second rule. Five second rule. Oh, you respond. Breathe, then respond. Sometimes I have to walk away from things. Um, I used to, I had this guy that I dated for like six, seven years and nobody could push my buttons faster than he could. And we would take each other from zero to 60, not the best way. And eventually I was really grateful for the fact that I was able to just say, hey, I can't talk to you about this right now. I feel myself getting irrational. And I know when I start to feel irrational, no more, no progress is going to be made in this conversation. Like eventually if you get pushed, you'll get reactive. And if he kept nattering at me and being antagonistic, I would literally just hang up the phone and I wouldn't pick it back up until I knew that I was in a space that was calm enough and de-escalated that I could have a healthy conversation that was actually going to get us to a functional place. But creating that space, that willingness to just yeah. have a strong enough boundary that says, no, I'm not going to do this because I know that I can't be the best that I can be that like, I'm not going right. to have a listening for you, what you had to say and whether or not you're right or you're wrong, you don't deserve the level of antagonism that I, I'm going to want to wrong target at you because I right. am having, I'm being triggered by my wounds that I haven't yet right. had time to heal. And that's like healthy accountability. Right. And I think of something so fundamental. I mean, what you're saying, what I'm hearing or understanding, which I relate to the adulthood um, initiation journey is like emotional maturation is what uh -huh. we're talking about at a fundamental level, which means that we can be responsible for our emotional experience, which really means that like emotions, like fundamentally one, like a huge not understanding in our culture that emotions need to be di um, digested and felt and through that digestion process, just like anything else that, that, that um, digests in the body, whether it's air or food or water, it has a byproduct, which is like some form of uh, releasing. So like when right. you're angry, the way you feel it is to fucking be angry at something, but not, not something living that will like be impacted. <laughs> Same with fear or sadness, like you need to be felt. And there's something that like shaking or crying, like things that, that happen. And that's fundamentally a skill that especially men are really um, untutored in. And Cry, a, box, play pool, chop wood, like do something physically to get it out of your body. You know, right. like but don't go, don't go. And so Jake and I, we have horses. And so it's like, you don't go ride your horse when you're pissed off. That's not fair to your horse. Oh That's no! I like I, I mean, I've had my motorcycle kicks mm. my ass enough. I'm not gonna go uh, get on horseback when I'm not in a good mood. Um, Blackjack is going to tell me that he's not okay with my energy and put me on my ass. Yep. <laughs> Bingo. Bingo. Which is why, which is why an animal like a horse is because it's such a great teacher of a relationship. And human beings have like a very similar energetic emotional mm. system we're just more skilled at like manipulating it and manipulating um, each other where a horse is going to give you direct feedback and like no bullshit as is the earth. And for me, the earth is always where I go to like uh, release and is the fundamental like teacher of like, if I come to the earth grabbing unlike balance, she will not give me shit. But if I come balanced, there's great abundance and like relationship and partnering that can um, happen. And that for me has just been big when actually working with humans, it really is this like five second. And then like from that um, expanding out of like, what do I need to go deal with my trigger, which I also fail at often. And it's a big journey because the other part of 
what's difficult of the um, insurance journey is that the more you go on this like descent of facing the pain and the wounds, the more for a while you might get more unbalanced. Like it's easier just to be numbed out. But the more you, the, when you start to like unnumb, you're going to start to feel more and you might get more triggered, more kind of chaotic for a while. You'll need to have the resource and the containership to hold that and just like expect that. And that's actually healthier. That's part of the evolutionary path and it does shift, but there is a time where it has to like get worse as oh, you yeah. like deal with your pain but okay. prior to it getting better. There's a, uh, a saying that I have to remind myself of sometimes when life seems chaotic and I'm just like, what the actual fuck? Excuse my language audience. Um, but it, <laughs> the saying is, when you bring order, chaos blows off, mm -hmm. right? You sweep a really dirty room, like the dust is all gonna right. come up in the air, right? Bingo. Doesn't matter how softly you're sweeping, it's still, the dust is still gonna fly up a little bit, which is why you always dust after you sweep. <laughs> but, oh my gosh, I'm thinking with our, with our trauma and our little wounds that we wrap and cover and they fester and they grow underneath that bandage. And to get them right. to go away, sometimes we have to pull that bandage off and we have to rip it wide open. We have to let it bleed to get to a place where we can grow new skin and heal. Yeah, Bingo. Ab absolutely. And so it's just to, when that chaos comes up to just do take deep breaths, do the things that help you increase your bandwidth, go for a walk, you know, so on and so forth. And pet a horse. have faith. Yeah, pet, pet a horse and just have faith in that transition that things will settle back out as long as you continue to move forward and don't just sit. Like you have to continue the process of bringing order for the, the chaos to completely disperse itself. Right, and this is like exactly, and that's what I was saying about the emotional experience of like to bring order, there's the chaos that needs off-putting. And like this gets for me to a deeper level. It's like, okay, so what do you do? If the path is that it has to get harder, in order to get better, like, again, it comes back to this topic of resource, but this is the thing for men, which is so fucking key. It's like, you need help. <laughs> we need help. Guidance. And we need to learn to ask for help and guidance. And for me, there's different like levels, like at the deepest level for me, this is like a fundamental relationship with something larger than myself. You could say like mystery or God or spirit. And there's like, I have a relationship I've worked fucking hard at and it's way different than I ever thought it would be about asking for help in like a cosmic sense. But on the like way to like that, I just name it because I think it is uh, important. That's a big part of 12 steps or other deep healing journeys. But on the like way, there is a path of like learning to ask to, for, for help from people, you know, from mentors, guides, therapists, allies. And that's a big ego death in a way to ask for help and be like, I can't just do it um, alone. Um, and yeah. so m many men are not encouraged or have even the resource to know to ask for help because there's so much shame, you know, and you talked earlier, it's like shaming doesn't work. And I've watched a lot of documentaries um, involving the criminal justice um, system and like how messed up that whole system is because of um, it being built of shame and, and blame and then um, excluding. But most of these men that have committed horrendous crimes were I think doing so at a deeper level out of like a lot of unfelt undigested shame which then translated to them being like I'm bad so I'm going to just to like do bad or doing bad is the only way yeah and there's this huge healing and working through shame that is like part of the path of asking for help and getting a resource and facing the like pain that for me is like a big centerpiece of this whole healing uh, um, enterprise, which I'm referring to as adulthood um, initiation. That's beautiful. I really appreciate you bringing that forward. And, you know, so often when people do something that's considered dysfunctional um, or would be shameful or crim criminal, it's really just because people have needs that are not being met. Foundational yeah. needs. They're not feeling seen, they're not feeling heard or understood or accepted or safe. There's like literal physical and emotional safety that is not being provided in their households at different ages. 
and they don't know what to do either. It's not been modeled for them how to reach for help. Um, it's not been shown to be yeah. safe to reach out for help. And so they're just doing the best they can sometimes to survive on various levels. And so as a society, that's why it's so important. I feel like to create these opportunities, these containers for people to vulnerably share without the shame, without the invalidation and reminding people that it's not that you're condoning actions by not shaming and invalidating people for them. It's not about right. like, you forgive somebody. It's not that you're condoning the action that requires forgiveness. It's taking it to a deeper level. And it's like, I see that you're hurting. Um, I experienced a really traumatic thing mm. last year and it required a tremendous amount of growth, interpersonal growth for me when someone did something that was damaging and frightening. And I had to get to a place where it's like of grace and forgiveness and saying, wow, how much pain must that person be in to feel the need to try and do so much harm to another? And having the grace of like, that's a human being. And as a, a, a spiritual, another human being that's out there being like, I really like, here are my boundaries to keep myself safe, but I'm going to do my best to send like kindness to that person in genuine hope and care that they're able to get the this help that they need so that they can heal themselves and stop doing damage to the world around them and by default themselves. Because when we strike out at others out of pain within ourselves and insecurity and fear, we're still doing damage to ourselves that then we have to heal later. Because I feel like most human beings out there at the core are good people. And so we, we right. struggle. Um, totally. Um, yeah, yeah, you have a guest. Does somebody want to jump on screen with you? <laughs> no, I'm just seeing my fiance eating lunch, looking at me. Uh, probably. Hey guys, I'm actually on the phone with my, uh, with my ortho scheduling my next surgery. I will check back in in a second. If you're still on the line, I'm almost done. Okay, sounds okay. good. Thanks, yeah, Jake. Jake uh, had a motorcycle accident and um totally destroyed his knee um they like, ripped it all to pieces but um he is going he's getting better and he's very strong and wise to do the things that are correct um and uh, yeah so lots of different things and how we engage with human beings in the world <sighs> Jake, i shared about your knee i hope that's okay no that's that's perfectly okay yes i um i had like the the most ridiculous motorcycle wipeout ever it was completely a five mile an hour turn a corner drop the bike coming up my own street i live on a slope and um when i laid the bike down i laid it down to the left i mean i laid it down i did almost no damage to the motorcycle but um when i put my foot down i put my foot down on my toe instead of oh. flat on the slope so my leg slid um, steel toe, you know, hard toed motorcycle boots. And I ended up rolling over my left leg and pretty much kissing my left foot on my way over. And um, I, I got what football players call the unhappy triad, which is I tore my uh, MCL, my ACL, and my meniscus. And I also, in addition to that, completely severed, complete rupture in my patellar tendon. So my kneecap popped halfway up my thigh. Um, and I've been three months into it and doing quite well with recovery and putting a lot of effort into physical therapy. And I've managed to get 93 degrees of articulation back in my leg and I just can't get anymore. Um, and, and the surgeon looked at me and he said, it's scar tissue. So what they're going to go in is clear out all the scar tissue and forcibly manipulate my leg to about 110 degrees articulation while I'm out. And then, uh, mm day after surgery, jump right back into physical therapy. But I have a motorcycle and I have a horse and I'm going to ride both of them again. So that was a, that was a call I've been waiting for to jump off in the middle of this, but uh, surgery is next Wednesday. So I'm glad I jumped on it right away. And God bless you, Charles George VA Community Care for matching me up with the surgeon who does the knees for the Carolina Panthers NFL. That's awesome. Nice. Getting me taken care of properly. That's fantastic. I'm really glad you're getting the support that you need, Jake. 
It's, yeah. uh, There's my caveat. Sorry about that. But yes, no need, I'm, I'm, no need to be sorry. I'm, I'm terrified uh, about another surgery and thrilled that it's happening at the same time. I understand on a very deep level with that com comment. Right. After two low back surgeries, I'm like, yeah, it's both of those things. Uh-huh. Um, well, and just to say, it's a really similar, like I worked with, I'm working with a healer for a long time and he actually likens this process of like emotional maturation and healing a lot to like having yeah. uh, like hurt knee in the process of healing it, which is like the need to like first take all the pressure off of that hurt place and then really like, you know, ask for help, you know, whether it's getting surgery or, or like figuring out fixing at a deeper level what's going on and then slowly putting pressure. This is where challenge and other things come in back on that part and building up strength um, organically. And it's really hard. Yeah. Is you have to go deeper first into the pain and then very organically put pressure and test things out over like time and have like guidance. Um, and our, um, and our um, emotional systems are very similar. They're just harder to uh, perceive than our uh, physical ones. Um, but it's like a great, like actually healing one's body is a really great metaphor or uh, learning for what it is to really heal this more energetic, emotional um, system. So um, sounds difficult, Jake, but it sounds like you're also very prepared and like integrated on how to really give, give your like body um, and yourself the care that you like need to hopefully come out in a way that won't have, will we'll not, not have a mark, but we'll be stronger in like a different kind of way. You know, like hope. It, it's been, it's been uh, three months since the accident. April, uh, May 30th was when I wiped out. So uh, no, actually it was April 30th. Yeah. April 30th. So it's been uh, pushing on three months and it has been, um, I'm very active. I spent 10 to 12 hours on my feet. It's a horse ranch, ride a motorcycle to work daily. Um, yeah, and uh, it's, it's having to embrace the fact that this is going to change my lifestyle and even the best hopes for recovery at 50 years old are not going to be what I was before the accident. And the recognition that uh, I was talking to a friend of mine today, and it, or not today, but the other day, and he was, he's a Marine that I served with who is now a school teacher and a musician. And we right. talked about him switching from the role of warrior to the bard and storyteller. And I look right. at myself as well, switching from crossing that line from the warrior to the elder, from, from you know, uh, I, I referenced it once as, as, as putting down the war hammer and picking up the book of wisdom. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you're amidst a really big rite of passage in this I am. moment. And you're like embracing the necessary facing of death of this one stage, this one um, identity which has with it all sorts of, you know, gifts and challenges and putting that down um, and allowing yourself to like ritually and symbolically and practically pick up this new place. And just thank you for sharing that here and for being on that journey, what sounds like a really integrated way, you know, of consciousness about how something non-physical is very much uh, a part of in mirroring this physical moment and this is how it happens you know you like have to just accept and integrate and deal with what came right you didn't necessarily choose this at some level but here you are and you're making the like most beauty from it i'm actually planning something with some friends moving forward mm -hmm. to uh to do something um, kind of ritualistic and ceremonial to honor yes. to honor this. I'm, I'm kind of like, uh, I joke about it with the one leg being as inactive as it is, okay, I've just experienced one foot in the grave. Um, so exactly that, going through a small death and progressing into another stage of life. And I really do want to honor that. Right. And this gets to me, if there's anything I could offer people out there is like, well, how do you do this? Like one of the key things um, of, a, of a, a rite of passage is this being witnessed in it, seen and acknowledged, really blessed. And for me, that comes down to like, at a really simple level, doing some sort of like story share. Uh, yes. My fiance just, my fiance just turned uh, 35 yesterday and she had some people over and did this like story share 
around some of the deeper, harder parts of her like journey and give herself a chance to be seen and witnessed and um, reflected and also blessed and also created this bigger kind of container of um, accountability to what she was calling in, you know, and I hear Jake, you're doing the same thing. And like that for me is just like this one simple takeaway. If you're in some kind of moment, which likely you are, if you're finding this, you know, just do yourself like a favor and create a small container to be heard and seen. It could just be having dinner with friends, but making the like purpose, like, Hey guys, I have some things to like share need to be heard in and then welcome their like feedback and their like blessing and they're your friends. It's going to be beautiful, maybe a bit challenging, but like it's already creating some like containership and holding and support around your journey. And that like that alone will change a lot. John, what was your oh, yes. biggest... And that, and that being willing to listen part is so important as well. Yeah. Amen. Uh, John, what was your biggest, um, most powerful rite of passage that you have personally experienced? Yeah. Gee, there's a few. I mean, for like me, one thing to say, the like adulthood initiation journey is like a many year journey built of many um, experiences. Um, you know, I can, I'm just going to link three. I did four years. Well, I've done it seven times. I did four specific years in a strong um, lineage of um, uh, Lakota held vision quest, which is known as um, Humblecha, which is going out in the wilderness into one spot um, without food and water um, for four days and four nights. I did that four years in um, a row, which is incredibly wild, challenging, and life-giving um, experience. And it was really a deep encounter of death, especially not drinking water for four days and, and nights. Um, and a lot came also around meaning and like, what is my, like I was able to enter a kind of liminal world and like almost like a psychedelic space of deeper conversation with the earth and quote my, my like soul. Um, but coming out of that, because for me, that's great. And that's a really like culturally um, construed experience and things happen in life, you know, that match that, you know, similar to maybe what's happened right now with Jake, where um, in 2019, I went on an ancestral pilgrimage to Eastern Europe. I have Jewish lineage on my on mother's side. And I really went and just faced the reality of like what happened in Eastern Europe and the land where my ancestors came from and where a cultural and physical genocide happened. And I like was with that and like digested that and made beauty with that. Um, and a few months later, and for me, I was also the first person in my family to go back to Europe after my family came and um, immigrated here. And it was interesting. I went I'm, to I'm sorry, which grave. part of Europe again? This, question. Um, this was like Eastern Europe. It was uh, okay. Ukraine, uh, Lithuania, and Poland. Um, right. And it was interesting because I was going to these like ancestors of my mother's lineage. And then a few months later, my mom died very suddenly. Um, she was probably healthy in like a home accident. And that was a, that was like the deepest, you know, she was who brought me into the world. Um, and our relationship wasn't peachy either. And there was a lot there, but it was a whole year. And for me, it was kind of like this final part of this adulthood um, initiation journey was like no more mom physically. And there was so much just, and I'd been doing the work for so many years around her and around our relationship and its brokenness. And this like came to this full circle, of real like integration and having to face death. And then this like new chance of life and this different like maturation that happened in me from how I was able to be with her like death and how I was able to be. And another thing is on these um, containers, when she like died, the friends I had um, around me, we lit a fire and tended it for like two and a half days um, straight and just nice. like sh shared the story of my mom's life and did what you do in such a moment. And then one year like later, which in some cultures, it, they say it takes, you know, the soul a year to really transition from the like living world to the ancestor world. We had a 24 hour fire to kind of mark the year um, anniversary and kind of the end of this formal grieving period, at least in like Judaism, there's like a year of formal grieving. Um, and I got to again, like be witnessed, share the um, story, 
grieve like publicly and also then close that container very consciously. And not that I still don't grieve at times, but it's like different now. I'm not in this active formal year of grieving and like just the whole uh, maturity and like cultural um, containership I was blessed to know how to bring to that uh, experience really just cemented something in like me. And now I'm in a new way as a adult male without a live about like physical plane living mother, but like a much enhanced spiritual plane relationship nice. with her and with the great mother. Um, and really feeling on the uh, other side of this like progressive initiation into death, you know, as a like ally and as a, as something that is part of my life daily and a big thing that will continue to be faced, you know, as things unfold on this planet. Thank nice. you so much for that powerful and beautiful share, John. I really appreciate it. Um, you talk about being death being in your life on a daily basis. I know that you hunt. And so can you talk mm -hmm. to us a little bit about like your belief system of the masculine archetype and the connection to death and hunting and that sacred act yeah you know for like me i'm actually reading a book right now called hunting as a rite of passage um i grew up hunting and you know like it's similar to what you're saying about that five um percent rule i feel like we have this cultural image of hunters often as like beer drinking firing guns randomly trophy hunting which is absolutely terrible um and the reality is that most hunters, at least in like Colorado, where I come from, are just like, you know, average, good hearted people. And this is the way they're finding a deep um, relationship with nature. Some of the best um, conservationists come from the world of um, hunting. Um, and it's not really understood or um, initiated in the way that how, I guess, precious and quote, sacred it is to take life. Um, and over the years of evolving the path I've gone on, I'm like, wow, hunting is kind of like one of the pinnacle, um, experiences I do as a human being. Cause I am like very consciously with something very, you know, it's one thing for me to go into my garden and grab plants or eat some eggs from a chicken, but to like hunt an elk, which is this like mammal, this huge feeling sentient being, um, it's quite something in I get that we live in a time where you don't necessarily need to eat meat to like live. And um, there is something profound. And I say for men essential around at least once having a encounter with one's own power of taking life and an encounter that's held, that's culturally like formulated with mentors and support and guidance or one is trained not just in the like skill set because there's a deep skill set of so many like you could say like ethical like um skills like similar to the really probably beautiful skills you have to learn in the um military of like how to be patient how to be really like precise and dialed and disciplined um but also for like me approaching hunting again in this manner of like what would it be to be able to fully take life with a open heart? You know, and I've also, I know people that have approached the same journey with animals that they like raise, maybe raising a, a goat eventually to take its life for me and for some kind of deep honoring and like offering. Um, and it's for like me, something where I'm trying to build a life slowly in as deep of immediate um, relationship with the earth as I can, which is slow. I'm not living like fully in the woods, just like I'm talking to you on the internet on my computer. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm trying to bridge like worlds and I'm still slowly on this journey. And I see hunting as like a fundamental part of that, that can really be an incredible teacher when it's held well of like how to really be with this power of life and death. And then when I'm ever eating meat in my life, I know exactly though like, at a bone deep level, like what that actually means for that meat. So it's not this like abstract, which is the problem with, I think, eating meat when it is in this abstract factory farm world, right? Of course, there's tons of negative consequences to that. But if we 
can build a relationship like hands-on with death in some kind of way, we're then much more conscious with all of the death happening in our like life and how to really be with that in a emotionally online and like mature and therefore possibly ethical way. Right. Nice. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Thank you. I have hunted and I don't at the moment. Um, I still have the equipment. Um, I grew up in a family that, uh, oh, I grew up in South Florida in, in uh, a little town, beach town just south of Fort Lauderdale. So there wasn't a lot of hunting going on there, but we fished right. ridiculously. We had, an, we had alligators? A, oh, I never hunted alligators either, but I <laughs> ate plenty of them and I had relatives who did. Um, we, uh, we had a boat, my father had a boat for the ocean and a boat for inland. So regardless of the weather, um, unless we were in hurricanes, we were almost every weekend, either in the ocean or in the Everglades fishing. Uh, my father had grown up duck hunting, deer hunting, that sort of thing. We had, uh, antlers on the wall with a double barrel shotgun laid across them, that kind of thing growing up. Um, and when my father retired from from working in the commercial AC industry in South Florida, he moved to North Carolina and bought a piece mm. of property, about 15 acres, cleared part mm. of it, put a house on it, and the rest of it, his sole intention was to get back into hunting. And my father got uh, um, mm. esophageal cancer and died within two years. Mm. And while he was in recovery from surgery of it, I moved up to North Carolina and was spending time helping take care of him. And one of the things we kept talking about was hunting together. And when I got out of the Marine Corps, I never got into hunting because my feeling was that I had been trained to hunt those that shoot back. So there's nothing to sport in this and I'm not going to engage in it. Um, and, and a variety of other complicated things that would take way, I, I don't want to hijack this, so I'm not going to go there. But my father and I never hunted together, but we talked a lot about hunting together. And my father and his family had been really into archery. And um, my pops always complimented me that uh, I was born with an eye for, for shooting, for archery, for rifle, mm -hmm. whatever. I, I'm, I'm good. I'm really good. Uh, but we never got to hunt together. He passed away shortly before mm -hmm. hunting season opened in North Carolina. And hunting season in North Carolina is three seasons, bow season, black powder, and rifle season. So um, after he passed away, I went out on the opening day of bow season without a weapon and I found a place I wanted to be and I sat and watched and I went out the second day of bow season and about an hour after sunrise, I had my first doe and um, I didn't hunt again until black powder season opened and I went out on the first day of black powder season and I sat in his property and you know went where I thought was a good spot and sat and watched and I went out the second day of the season with the black powder rifle and I got my second doe. And I uh, waited till rifle season opened and same exact story, went out the second day of rifle season and got another doe. And I had my brother-in-law and my uh, cousin were both hunting on the same property. And my cousin had come in from out of town and spent a week out hunting. And both of these guys spent thousand plus dollars a season on deer blinds and camouflage and corn bags and all sorts of things. And I was doing uh, you know, blue jeans and jacket and no blinds finding a place to park. And my brother-in-law, not my brother-in-law, but my, uh, my cousin had a spot set up in a blind that he had been in a week long and not even seen a deer. <clears throat> and we were not in good terms at this point in time. It was shortly after my father's death and that's a whole complicated story too. Um, so I sat up about 200 yards away from where he had a spot set up. And um, I uh, took a, a young buck from that spot. And it was the only time I've done anything, I've killed anything to prove a point. And I did it because him and I were at odds and I didn't like how he was hunting and didn't feel that he was being respectful to it. So I went and set up in his area in a different spot and took a buck from his spot just to kind of prove a point. Oh, he lost, he must've lost reception. Uh, reception can get a little bit spotty sometimes in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, mm. Yeah, there's there's a lot there to unpack. He'll probably pop on back here. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, just to say what I'm really hearing from is this, like, whether we're wherever or not, that energy of 
being with death is so, I think, essential to being a human. And I think for men, because we don't experience it again in our body in the same way that women or female bodied folks do, that it's a fundamental thing to find your way into, whether that's through hunting or other like means. And just that acknowledging that there is something in you longing for like that. And that I'd say life like has meaning because of its relationship with like death, which is why for me, it's often like a big part. And something I didn't say in my little uh, story is, um, maybe I'll wait for Jake to come back in and then loop his points. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. My computer died. I just had to log in on my phone. You're fine, my friend. No worries. <laughs> I, I the most inappropriate time to crash too. No. Hey, no, no way. We're still, we're still, I'm with you. Yeah. We, we want to hear. So um, I haven't hunted since then. I felt really guilty about that one because my intentions were not correct. Um, the first three times I, I hunted, uh, the first three animals that I killed, I did it um, with my father's tools in his places. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was honoring him. Yeah. And I felt like the way that everything was done from, from uh, you know, the way that I went out and watched and observed first and made my choice. And then the way that I processed the, the, the animal, everything, I felt that I was honoring my father and honoring the animal. And the last one, I felt guilty about afterwards. I, I, I felt that I had done it for the wrong reasons. Um, sure. I felt that I'd done it to prove a point. I felt that I'd taken an animal that for any other purpose at any other time, I would have never harvested. I would never shot. I would have let him live. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, uh, I, I'm getting a little teared up about it. I still feel guilty about it. I haven't hunted since. Um, it's not that I wouldn't. And I've mm -hmm. considered it recently, especially bow hunting. I feel, I feel there's a purity in that. But, um, but I have, it's a bridge I have yet to cross again with myself. And I don't know that I would cross it without the necessity to hunt. Right. Right. Jake, you and I had briefly spoken about um, your experience with your father's death and um, relating it to different experiences you've had with animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Horses and dogs and so on and so forth. Um, do you want to share that really quickly? Or not when, now, when, just as it is? <laughs> when... Um, when we think about death and grieving, I was, uh, when, when uh, Alicia first dropped this subject on me, the thing that immediately went through my mind and something I'd had a recently had a conversation with somebody else about was that um, I have grieved the loss of a lot of, uh, a lot of companions and pets in my life and a lot of people in my life. But when my father died, um, you know, I have shed a lot of tears over a lot of things, but when my father died, I didn't. Uh, when my father died, it locked my emotions down. Um, my dad was, kind of the family patriarch he was he was the hub and the the point of contact for everybody else in the LaRue clan and uh I was very disconnected for most of my young life I'm the only one out of my generation that enlisted and that served and I I just didn't have that that connection with my generation my generation didn't have that connection with themselves overall um, I felt a lot of pressure when my father passed away uh, you know, to, to try to keep the family collective together and to fill that footprint as the patriarch. I was absolutely neither equipped for it or welcome to it by the rest of the family. And it was, um, it was hard. I've had a, I've still, I'm still dealing with the grieving process when it comes to the loss of my father. I've got a lot of mixed emotions with it, and I've never had a good cry over it. But I've, I've lost my shit over companion animals that I've lost and over close friends that I've lost. And I, I annually participate in Memorial Day and veteran cer ceremonies that, that just completely choke me up. And I can't watch a war movie without crying. Shit, I can't watch a commercial without crying half the time these days. So let's be honest about it. I'm, I'm getting very in touch with my emotions these days. But um, yeah, I've never, I, I still feel like there's a process yet to happen in addressing the death of my father. And that whole thing with male archetypes, feeling that need as the oldest son of an oldest son of an old family name to fill those shoes that he carried. Um, but also not having a son myself and my sister not having a child and knowing that generationally we're where the buck stops. 
Um, I, I have a lot of mixed feelings about that from a traditional man's perspective. I would, uh, on one level, love to have had a son to carry on my name. On another level, would absolutely loathe to raise a male child in today's culture. And also know that for the majority of my life, I have not been in a position to be anybody's daddy. Um, way too free for all, way too fly by night, way too irresponsible with my own care and feeding to be considerate of somebody else's. So knowing those things, yeah, that's, that's kind of where it all goes into. When my, when my dad passed away, I am not the father figure to fill the patriarchal traditional role that another man would fill in that. I watched in my mother's family when my grandfather passed away. I watched my uncle, the only, only male child in that generation, to step up and fill that role. And they still vacation together and are a bit of a collective. Um, but my generation's not. We're scattered around the country. We uh, maybe bump into each other and put a like on somebody's Facebook post. Um, you know, my sister and I are in the same state. And my mom is too. So my core family is in place. But um, we, uh, we come from a, 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 my mom's side, a big Irish background. And on my father's side, a, a, you know, a big, um, shit Heinz 57 but but all over the place background and from uh from east coast to west coast and we just don't stay in touch anymore and for me that's a level of conflict and guilt because I felt that as the eldest son that was a spot that I was supposed to fill was to pull the family together like that um come to terms with it's not going to happen <laughs> it's just we don't live in that world anymore uh, and we have all gone in our different ways and are embracing our different lives. And, you know, and, and I hope that some of our traditions carry on with some of the families, but they aren't so much with my own. Right. And I do grieve that. I respect it and I'm willing to move forward without, uh, but I do feel the loss of it. I do feel that loss of core family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think sometimes the, initiatory path brings us to a place of grief at like some of the like very like sobering realities of the face i know many people that on their um initiatory path had to actually come to a place with with like through a lot of of effort of realizing a relationship with their mom or dad or brother or somebody in their family wasn't actually possible in like a healthy mature way yeah. and they had to really like consciously put it down and there's this part of that journey. It's, it's, it's not about life necessarily being rosy or you like, it's actually about facing that sometimes because of the world that we live in and what's happened, there's a lot that's not. And can we like maturely hold boundary to it and accept it and still move forward and not be like dragged down by it, but move forward powerfully in our like lives, letting go and holding boundaries where we like need to, to then give life where we can. And when there's the, that possibility. So yeah. Also want to yeah. say, beautiful. Um, um, I'm gonna meet at at two, and I need to eat a little bit uh, yeah. but before. So for me, wrapping up in the next like five to eight to ten minutes would be helpful. Um, yeah. That would feel, Absolutely. Feel, feel good. No worries. Feel. I appreciate people who articulate their needs and their boundaries. <laughs> you, you beat me to it, my man. I gotta pick up my wife from work in about ten minutes. So. Awesome. Well, look at that beautiful closing. Gentlemen, do you have any closing statements um, about death, masculinity, anything at all um, in general? Mm. Uh, one thing that came to mind through this whole conversation that, uh, that I heard um, expressed actually, uh, oh, Warwick Schiller, again, I love this guy, man. His, uh, he's he's he, great. He's, We've had him on the show before. <laughs> His, his last podcast, a statement that was made that really got to me was um, that has to do with this hero intellect that we're so attached mm -hmm. to. Uh, the Lakota right. Sioux, the, the biggest thing for their men was not to be the hero, but to, but to be the common man. How do I be the best common man? And I think right. that's something that, you know, we're raised to worship our heroes, but we're not raised to recognize the common man. And, and I think that's something that this conversation kind of helped me embrace as well, is that we don't always have to be that. We don't always have to be out there proving. We can be here embracing and, and holding space for and just participating in. 
beautiful. Thank you right. so much, Jay. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say that, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'd say the initiatory journey in many ways is following, you could say, the hero's journey, as Joseph Campbell and others have articulated it. But instead of needing to then be a hero to the culture, to like a society where you stand out, you're no longer the common man. It's like you become the personal hero in your like own, own like life, which in many ways humbly brings you down to earth and able to really squarely be a bridge and giving oh. your gifts in the, in the way that you like need and really facing and owning your like shit in a powerful way where you can do that and be that loving person for uh, others. And that's just what I bless for men out there going forward and yes. encourage people to reach out um, off website soon. And yeah, I'm just so grateful for this conversation happening for a woman to care enough to hold the space for like men to see the power of this like work. So thank you so much for um, inviting us here and giving your gift of being such like a talk show host. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah. You're very, very welcome. And thank you so much, John. I really appreciate everything both you and Jake have brought to the table this afternoon, your vulnerability, your candor, um, your truth and wisdom. I really appreciate both of you and your kind words and support as well. So um, on that lovely note, I hope that you both have a wonderful day. And uh, gentlemen uh, watching, Feel free to reach out to both of these incredible men and uh, there's always more that they can share. So until next time. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>